Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Franca Tamaris, and I'm the events coordinator at Melbourne Energy Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today we are gathered on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years and we acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders past and present. For those tuning in online today, we invite you to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands you are listening in from as well. Thank you all for joining us for the second instalment of the MEI Network Series Seminar for 2023, which focuses on energy commodities. We have some interesting seminars scheduled for the year, and we invite you to join, invite you to join us for those too. Some housekeeping for our online audience. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box as a chat function is disabled. We have some we will have some time for Q&A for online audience and those in the room during the session. We will endeavour to get through as many of those questions as we can. Now to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Neelesh Sina, a senior hydrometallurgist at ANSTO who works within the minerals business unit, where he, excuse me, where he is responsible for the project management and process development activities. He has over 20 years of hydrometallurgical experience specific to the commodities of copper, gold, molybdenum, is it? Molybdenum. Molybdenum, uranium and vanadium. He joined Anstone in 2015. Prior to that, he was employed as a charge d'affaires with Arano in France, where he was responsible for supporting the front end nuclear fuel cycle activities in the, in the areas of business development, operational and project support, test work services, and research innovation programs. He holds a Bachelor of Science with honours from James Cook University and a PhD from the University of Sydney. Today's uh, moderator is Associate Professor Catherine Mumford, Head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Melbourne and the Hydrogen and Clean Fuels Program Leader at the Melbourne Energy Institute. Thanks again for joining us and now over to you, Nilesh. Thank you, Franco. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great, thanks. Uh, thank you for um, inviting me to, uh, uh, to Melbourne Energy Institute and present uh, the opportunity to present this, uh, this presentation on uranium mining and actually milling is the word to, ura to uranium uh, oxide concentrate. Uh, the term refining was mentioned in the title, but refining means a different thing in the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, it means beyond the oxide concentrate. Um, so how many people here have actually heard of ANSTO? Well, oh, that's a good couple of people. All right, so that, that's actually a photo of the Lucas Heights uh, campus. Um, the reactor is just over there. Uh, minerals is over here. So uh, ANSTO um, has been around for uh, since uh, 1953, actually. We've just celebrated 70 years. Uh, we were... Uh, known with the name of AAEC, which was Australian Atomic Energy Commission at that time. Uh, in 1987, we transitioned to the name ANSTO. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and we've been uh, involved in supporting nuclear uh, science and technology uh, work since then. And in that space there, we are responsible for running critical infrastructure to deliver high impact science. So uh, we've got accelerators, cyclotron. Uh, you can see the Opal reactor photo on the right there. And on the left, you will be able to see that synchrotron, which is uh, in Clayton here. That's now also under the stewardship of uh, ANSTO. And um, ANSTO, within ANSTO, they are commercial products and business uh, uh, section, which basically has all the different business units. Uh, you've got detection and imaging uh, just over here. Uh, do people recall in February there was a, there was an incident in WA where uh, it was termed the media dubbed it uh, radioactive tic tac that was lost. So uh, that device there was uh, it was called Chorus 360. That device was basically uh, rejigged to actually sit on a truck that would help to identify that. So that's one of the one of the tools that Ansel has developed in its marketing that was used to to locate that source. Um, the other thing that I'd probably like to bring to attention is silicon radiation. Uh, at Lucas Heights, uh, the reactor is actually used to uh, 
to uh, irradiate silicon, which is blocks of silicon, which is used in making semiconductors. Uh, and that basically provides about 40 to 50% of the world's market, okay? And those, those irradiated silicon goes into high-end applications like making uh, chips in for, for high-speed trains. In minerals, uh, that's us there. And we are a, a, a group that's got about 60 people uh, involved in doing, uh, we've been around for 40 years and we provide a practical solution and, and innovative technology to the industry. We've got... Uh, more than 20 global clients uh, in different locations. And we do work basically from band scale to semi to continuous pilot plant and then piloting and demonstration scale. So, uh, and that's the service we've been providing. Uh, early on when Ensta started, we were doing a lot of work in uranium, but in 2000s and onwards, we moved into rare earths uh, separation. And uh, in the last, uh, last few years, we've actually been working in lithium, uh, uh, graphite and also uh, critical minerals in the sense hafnium, niobium, tantalum, uh, so those exotic metals. So that's ANSTA. Uh, the plan for today is I'll run through uh, as stated there, just provide a bit of background, some fast facts. Uh, we'll probably take a short break with some questions uh, in that juncture. Then we'll move to the, to the processing aspect uh, with a short break after that because I'm quite sure lots of people will probably be We'll have questions or we'll be overwhelmed. We'll see. And then we'll talk about you know, innovations and Australian operations and project and the future challenges and opportunities that, that are there. Okay, so I guess everybody knows about nuclear power generation. Uh, one of the benefits about nuclear power generation is the fact that it's, uh, it's considered a clean and it has a clean energy profile. Uh, it's affordable at levelized cost and it's also reliable and pro provide base load power. So that chart there that you see at the bottom, you can see that nuclear actually sits quite low in terms of uh, CO2 footprint, okay, CO2 generation per kilowatt hour. And uh, this is the, a profile of actually retirements and capacity um, uh, generation coming up. And you can see that there's a tendency at the moment more towards uh, uh, having a bit more nuclear build. And some countries who have scattered their nuclear plants are now looking at restarting it. And they've got emerging countries coming through as well. The other thing is that's coming up uh, in that space is the, the use of small modular reactors and also uh, uh, which is called SMRs. And the other thing that's called now is MMRs, which is uh, micro modular reactors. So those uh, will be key drivers for, for uranium demand. And this is the nuclear fuel cycle. So how many people here have seen what nuclear fuel cycle looks like? All right, so I'm expecting a couple of questions from that corner. <laughs> um, Australia is actually involved in the exploration, mining, and milling to make uranium oxide concentrate. Okay, so that's basically taking from, from finding the deposit to actually making a concentrate or yellow cake, it's called, and then it goes out. Uh, conversion to uh, uranium uh, hexafluoride is basically needed for the enrichment process to work, which uses... Um, uh, centrifuges and I think the future aspect will be looking at using lasers to do the separation. So U235 is the, the key, key isotope here that actually helps you make power. Uh, and in the natural material, you're looking at only 0.7%. The enrichment process will take it to about three and a half percent for, for light water reactor fuel. Okay. Uh, once you've done your enrichment, you can make your fuel uh, pellets that goes into your power generation. Uh, once it's been in your reactor for four to six years. You bring it out, you actually have it uh, wet storage for about a year or so to reduce all that heat. Then it, go di then it can go into dry storage. And after that, uh, you can actually recover some of the uranium and plutonium via reprocessing. And once the reprocessing waste has come through, it goes for storage and disposal. Now, as I said, Australia is only looking at the first dot point there. The rest of it takes place uh, overseas, so especially in uh, France, uh, Russia, uh, some of it in UK and Netherlands. Okay. In terms of uranium market pricing, so lots of people will probably see the prices. Uh, most of the time, it's actually referring to spot price, but there are there are two markets in the sense for pricing. You have the spot price, and you have the long term contract price. Uh, there's a chart there that's actually showing you uh, the profile of uh, uranium appreciating in the last three years. Um, and one of the key drivers has been the fact that because the price was so low, some of the operators had actually throttled or cut back production. 
And the other thing that's been interesting in that space has been the fact that there's been financial instruments that have been active in the spot market. So you've got uh, ETFs uh, and some of the companies actually buying uranium from the spot market and taking it away. Uh, and the key thing is that, you know, for, for any sort of future development, the price needs to be as high as $60 to $80 to, to incentivize new mine production. Uh, the photos you see there, courtesy of BHP, on the left is uh, they produce ammonium diurane. It's called ADU. It's, it looks yellow. It's called yellow cake, but that's not the product that they sell. That's an intermediate. Uh, what they sell is the black product there, but it's still considered as it's uranium oxide, but people still think it's yellow cake as well. In terms of resources, well, um, you can see that Australia's got uh, the largest amount, and, and most of that is actually represented by Olympic Dam operation in South Australia. So we are the, the largest uh, resource owner. But what's interesting to note is the fact that, that if you look at the, the red book that uh, uh, the NEA releases and the OEC releases, basically, uh, they the resources actually exploitation, the resources break them down into different categories of pricing. Uh, Australia's uh, pricing sits at about $40 to $80 a kilo, okay, for, for, for that expectation. Uh, but here you'll see the production from different countries and you can see that Kazakhstan is the largest producer, okay? And that's because their resource actually sits at less than $40 a kilo. So they use, so I'll touch on that a little bit more, but you can see that in terms of production, there's 17 countries involved, Australia's second, and that's largely coming from Olympic Dam. Uh, seven countries account for 94% of the, the production. And one of the things to, to note is the geographic variation, okay? So you got deserts of Africa, so Namibia, Niger, where uranium has been produced, to plains of Central Asia, like Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, and then the Arctic tundra of Canada. So quite a quite a wide uh, variation in location. Now, in terms of production volumes, typically you would say that the production is about 50,000 tons, but in the last few years that has dropped down to about 45,000 tons. And you can see, if you look at the Canada contribution, that's significantly reduced. That's because the local producer, Kamiakwa, had opted to keep the uranium in the ground because the price was a, the, the market price was a disincentive for them. So they valued uh, keeping that resource in the ground. And as a consequence, I think Kazakhstan had throttled its uh, production slightly as well, but by and large, it, it represents uh, a large portion of the market. In terms of methods of production, uh, there's a couple of types. Most people have heard of open pit uh, and, and underground. But for uranium, there's another one that's really interesting. It's called in situ leaching. Uh, and I'll explain that a little bit more in detail. But what uh, this shows is the fact that the, sorry, the ISL in situ leaching part is the part that's actually growing in terms of production. Uh, underground mining, which is most of the Canadian operations, they had throttle back production. Uh, and you have got opportunity as well for coal or by production as well uh, from gold and base metals. So Australia's production from Olympic Dam. Olympic Dam does produce uranium, but it's recognized as a copper mine, okay? It's a copper operation. So. In terms of producers, uh, 10 companies represent about 94% of the global market, right? And 80% of that is concentrated in the six companies. Uh, and five of those companies are state-owned. So can anyone tell me which one is a non-state-owned entity on that list? Right, yeah. Chemical Canada is the only one that's not a state-owned enterprise. The rest is, Cazetta Prom is uh, from Kazakhstan. Orano is French. There's a French uh, government ownership in that. Uh, this is a Russian entity, the Chinese, and then uh, Navoy Mining and Metallurgical Company as well, which is a uh, Uzbeki operation. So that was a quick snapshot in terms of uh, markets. And uh, any questions on this? Are we good to go? What does a uh, handful of uh, uranium feel like? Uh, a rock? A handful of uranium? What is it? That's, stone or? Well, the ore will be stone. Or? The uranium itself, uh, once you've made it into something, into a, once you've concentrated, it's powder. But it comes from rock, so, yeah. A yellow cakes of powder. Yellow cakes of powder, that's right. Go back to your, go back to your, your 
So it's it's an or it's, it's an or on the left. That's right. And then, and then it's a gas. So yeah, yeah. So the gas has to be converted for for enrichment purposes. Um, so that's taking the oxide concentrate into. So when you so when you're working in this space here, yeah, the U two three five is only at 0.7 percent. It has to be made into three percent or above for for it to come into fuel. Okay, uh, but the U F six it's converted into uranium hexafluoride purely because. Uh, Fluoride doesn't actually have any other isotopes in the process, so it's it's only uranium that's actually separating across with these different isotopes. It's, it's worth saying here that each of those steps, sorry, each of those steps there is is quite often a physical, completely separate uh, location. Uh, that, so it's going from like Olympic Dam out of the ground as a rock into the mill, crushed to the powder, then it's going. And, and separated from the copper and everything. Then it's then it's going to a conversion plant, and it's coming out in a cylinder, and it's being transported somewhere else in, say, America, to the enrichment. That's that's right. And and and, and so forth. Yeah. So it, it gets moved around the world, like all over the place. It might take two years to get from the mine to the nuclear power plant. Absolutely. Yeah. It it is about two years at least. Yeah. So it's a very good point. Enrichment might be done by lasers. Where in this process would that be done? That's the part. Yeah, okay. So, lasers is the new technology, basically, uh, and it's less energy intensive. Because uh, at the moment, centrifuges, uh, you need thousands and thousands of centrifuges to get that enrichment level up. Um, and that is considered current technology. The previous technology was gas diffusion, which was even more intensive. Um, just to give you an example, a uh, gas diffusion plant that was used in France uh, at the site called Tricastan basically had its own four nuclear power reactors to provide energy for that. So very energy intensive. Okay. So uh, yeah, so the lasers, the lasers is under development. Uh, Silex is an Australian company that's actually uh, working to develop sort of commercializing that. So that will be a, a basically a paradigm change on that. But uh, it's only yeah, it's only at only in the enrichment where you're looking at lasers. Yeah. Is there any questions from the online audience? Only to use the microphone, but I had it on mute, so I apologize. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, all right, let's uh, let's move on onto uh, onto the processing side of things because I'm a hydrometallurgist, and that's uh, sort of where my um, experience is. Uh, so I'll just mark it up as process selection, but you know, various things come into the consideration. So you're looking at resource, um, where it is, how much of it do you have, uh, the mining method, uh, which techniques do you use, the mineralogy itself, where the uranium is actually sitting, uh, the grade has a big difference or impact, geographical location, as I mentioned, you know, examples of uh, recovering uh, uranium from deserts versus the Arctic tundra, you're going to have various constraints that come into that. Uh, which will also impact the economics. Uh, laws and regulations, I marked that there because um, if you look at the Australian context, you know, we have a federal uh, policy, but then mining is dictated by state policies as well, and each state has a different policy, so it's not universal. So those things introduce challenges as well if you're trying to develop projects um, and schedule as well. So, so first things, mineralogy. So the question the gentleman asked here, so yeah, uranium can be found in lots of minerals. So vanadates, carbonates, carbonates, oxides, phosphates, arsenates, sulfites, molybdates. Uh, but the mineral holding, the principal mineral uh, is pitchblende, uranite, and carnotite. So you can see the carnotite there at the bottom that's a very bright yellow particle. So carnotite is actually a mixture of uh, uranium and vanadium. Okay. I've got to ask, where, where did the names... <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Some of the names are quite interesting. Uh, where do they come from? Jo Johannite and Davidite, for instance. What's going on there? Yeah. Um, What's the story? I. That's a good question. I'm quite sure, probably, I'm guessing here, maybe some of the names of the people who found it, or there's some family elements involved in that. Uh, but I, full disclosure, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what the history of those names are. So... But it's worthwhile, I guess, you'd be able to find a mineral debt with the history of those minerals. Um, 
some of the minerals are quite easy to, to leach and, and exploit the, the uranium out, but some of them like brennerite, brennerite is quite uh, refractory, meaning it's very hard to get to, okay? This is a fantastic slide. I worked five years in a mining company, mining uranium, and I've never seen a slide like this. This is wonderful. Can you tell us, uh, are the ore bodies at Olympic Dam in South Australia and the ore bodies on the um, sandstone roll front in eastern South Australia, western New South Wales, and the ore bodies in in uh, the Northern Territory and Western Australia, are, are they all sort of one type or is there a variety of types? No, I, I think you'll probably find that there'll be a variation in terms of the minerals that are present. And uh, one of the things in terms of uh, exploiting a resource also comes down to the fact that what is the, the accompanying uh, impurities considered gang minerals as well. So that, that will have a huge impact. Um, and I'll, I'll probably expand on that more a bit down on the presentation. So just hold on to that question. Uh, so yeah, this is a can conventional process. Uh, you can see you got uh, mining at the top. You've got your uh, your it, you've you've dug out your your material. Then you're basically crushing and grinding it to make it smaller. Uh, you put into a leach process to actually uh, li uh, to put the uranium into solution. You're looking at uh, separating the solids out, taking the uranium and purifying it and enriching it. Then you're making it precipitate, calcining, packaging, transporting, and then one of the key things also for all the mining operations is actually, and milling operations is actually looking at waste treatment. So that, that's your conventional flow sheet. This is uh, what an open pit looks like. So I have, have people actually seen or been to open pits? Okay, so uh, this is a ranger. Uh, it's now undergoing rehabilitation, but the, it used open pit mining. And the, the key there is basically the ores at relatively uh, not too deep, so you can actually remove a lot of overburden material and get to it. But it does require a lot of heavy equipment for soil and waste removal. Uh, pros, you know, better ventilation, less costly than underground mining operations, but the cons are huge fit, huge footprint and um, expensive remediation. And on that part there, you'll probably be able to find out in the media exactly how much ERA is actually going to be costing its owners. Uh, the numbers are 800 million and then counting. So uh, having said that, rehabilitation has been not successfully in, in different parts of the world. So France is a good example. That's where I worked. You know, some of those old pits have been turned into uh, fishing hotspots. So it's done. And in Canada, Clough Lake just got its license back or it's given its license back to the, to, to the state because they've done the rehabilitation successfully. So yeah, it can be done. Uh, Wait, can I, excuse me, can I just clarify? So you're saying they actually fish. The hot spot doesn't refer to the uh, nuclear uh, radiation. No, no, it's been rehabilitated. Uh, yeah. It's been gone through yeah. a, a, a monitoring process and returned back to the state. But for the pit itself, they filled it with water and populated with fish yeah. so people could use it for fishing. What a wonderful story. I think, um, do, is there a, a document or book or report that, that we can we can get uh, access to? I can to? provide you a source. Uh, we'll yeah. we'll, we'll talk be, offline. And, yeah. 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 Um, on the other side, we're looking at underground mining. Now, there's a photo there of, uh, I think it's MacArthur River in Canada. Uh, these are the deeper ore bodies. Uh, it requires you to actually put vertical shafts in to get to the ore depth. You need to create tunnels and ramps and chambers. Uh, the pros are a smaller footprint, less waste because you're not moving as much material. The cons are, it is an expensive uh, operation and the remedial cost is still there. Um, just so people uh, have an understanding in terms of grades, we're talking about those two operations. Ranger had, I think about 0.2, 0.3%. Uh, MacArthur River sits at 5%. So just to give you an idea, if you convert percent into PPMs, for example, that's uh, 50,000 PPM at MacArthur River, whereas you're looking at 2,000 to about 5,000 PPM at Ranger. Nilesh, just, just a tiny point to add on that. Uranium, I was told by the chief energy geologist in Rio Tinto, is the only mineral on the planet that is being mined at um, grades spanning three orders of magnitude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Canada is special in a sense as well because for some of the operations, they actually have to dilute it down. Uh, <laughs> normally in mining, grade is king. The higher, the better. But in uranium, in some aspects, you have to sort of dilute it down, which is done in Canada. Is that uranium mine 
exclusive uranium, or is it mixed with other ores, or coal, or, uh, or those, whatever? Those ones are exclusively for uranium. Uh, all right. So, so I've talked about the mining itself. Uh, in the crushing, the objective is, you know, you're trying to actually uh, take large clumps of rocks uh, that have been blasted through uh, and reducing size. And the objective there is when you do a size reduction, by, you can do it by crushing. Uh, crushing is a very energy intensive process. So uh, uh, about 60 to 85% total energy usage for any mine site. And only one or 2% is actually very useful in crushing and the rest goes in uh, noise and heat material transfer. Uh, just the two images there, you can see that uh, you've got a gyratory crusher, picture of a gyratory crusher, and then you've also got a, a high pressure grinding rollers as well. So once you've done your size reduction from 1.5 meters down to about 20 millimeters, uh, it can be stored. Uh, you can use open storage or, or closed storage as well, where you actually have covers. Um, and basically the, the key there is you've got a stockpile now that actually goes into your plant. So your plant has a, a consistent feed. So there's, there's no disruptions. I have a question for the audience here. So on that picture in Somaya in Niger, what's that yellow material at the back? It's not uranium, by the way. It's not sitting in the open space. <laughs> Sorry? Sulfur. Very good. Yes. Yeah. It is, it is stock, stockpiles of sulfur because they use uh, sulfur to put it for the acid plant. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that can be done also uh, that in order to reduce the amount of material that goes downstream is actually looking at beneficiation. Um, so that's the objective here to increase the grade and reduce the tonnage. Uh, beneficiation techniques, there's various ones around. You can use gravity, uh, sizing, magnetic, electrostatic. Uh, flotation is one of the ones that's commonly used in mineral processing for making uh, base metal concentrates. Uh, sorting is another one. Uh, very few of those techniques actually uh, work for uranium, except for, funnily enough, radiometric sorting, because it's radioactive. So um, it has been applied at, at, um, at Rossing in Namibia. Well, so once you've basically reduced the material, you still have to uh, make it finer, so you can actually uh, leach the uranium out. So uh, you can use different types of equipment. So uh, sem semi-autogenous and autogenous milling will basically bring it down to about 100 microns. Uh, ball and rod mills will take it down to about 30 microns. Uh, stirred tower and iso mills are basically for very fine grinding. So it'll take it down to one, one micron. So the grinding circuits can be operated wet or dry. Uh, in, in the media itself, it requires a media. So in some cases they use actually metallic or ceramic balls. Uh, it can be operated in open and closed loop, okay? Um, the photo at the top there, when Ranger was operating, actually had a, a combination of wet uh, semi autogenous milling and ball milling to, to get the liberation. In Niger, uh, Somaya actually uses dry sag milling. Uh, Niger's, oh sorry, Somaya is actually in, uh, in, in the desert of Sahara Desert, part of Sahara Desert. So you would think that dry milling is actually for water conservation purposes. Is that, do you agree? Uh, that was my belief first as well when I started, but it's not. Uh, there's lots of water <laughs> under the aquifers, <laughs> underneath in the aquifers, but the, the dry mill is actually used because down the process, when you're actually getting the uranium out, you can actually have about five to 8% more recovery. So it's just the, the fact that it minerals responds better with the heat and in your dry space. So, the next step is basically once you've got your material, as I keep talking about, is leaching. So you need to bring the uranium into solution. Uh, the reagent choices are you can use acid, which is very common. So the picture that you saw before with sulfur, that's actually to produce acid on plant that goes into this process. Uh, whereas on the other side, when you have ores that have got uh, uh, alkaline and carbonate material, which will consume a lot of, a lot of acids, you can actually opt to do uh, carbonate leaching. So, you know, it will re dissolve uranium, but it won't really touch any of the impurities, especially iron, but it's, a, it's more expensive to use. Uh, again, the variables here, you'll be driven by mineralogy, grade, time, temperature, uh, and the options of equipment. You can do a dynamic process in a vet. A pachuca is just, a, I think it's a Spanish word for saying, you know, aerated tank. Um, you can have agitated tank and autoclaves as well. 
I've got heap leads and in situ leads mentioned, but we'll touch on that a little bit later once I've canvassed the conventional process. So you'll be able to see exactly how that fits in. Uh, and the, in the photos, Lodev plant that used, was operating in France, uh, actually that was for alkaline leaching that uses used autoclave. Um, Ferminec on, on the right there used acid pugging. So you have dry ore, actually they put acid in and actually let it cure on a belt that moves it for three to four hours before it goes into the leach process. And in Canada at McLean, they used uh, acid leach process in the uh, aerated tanks, copper chukas. So once you put your uranium into solution, you've got solution and solids, you need to actually separate the two now, okay? Um, there's a couple of techniques that are available. So uh, you can use uh, thickening infiltration, you can use countercurrent resin in pulp. The, the variables that drive this is basically uh, the method of leaching that you do. In terms of impurities, is there clay that's in the minerals that can impact the solid liquid separation? The particle size, water availability is gonna be another thing. Uh, solution grade and costs. So um, on the right, on my right at the top there, you'll be able to see that it says thickener at Langer Heinrich. So basically that's a thickener is another word for actually saying cementation or sedimentation, sorry. Uh, that's exactly what happens. You have a, a vessel where material comes in, it has time to decant and the solids basically go at the bottom and the liquor, which is relatively clean, moves forward, okay? Uh, in some cases, the underflow can actually go to a belt filter or depending on the material itself, it can go directly into a belt filter, which what which is what does, uh, what did happen at Cominec. I have to say did, because Cominec is now no longer operating. Uh, and CCDs are basically thickness in multi-stage where material flows counter current. Uh, and that's actually used at Langer Heinrich in Namibia. So resin in pulp is, uh, is um, another technique where basically you can, okay, sorry. Uh, resin in pulp is another technique. It's, uh, it's in a couple of slides. So I'll, I'll come, come back to that. So the next part is actually purification and concentration, okay? Um, now, again, once you've got your leach liquor, you need to separate the uranium out of that from all the impurities. And again, it's really dependent on solution flow, the grade, pH, uh, what impurities are coming in. Options available is solvent extraction and ion exchange, um, and also resident pulp. Now, how many people here are familiar with solvent extraction? All right. Okay, just to get everybody else an idea. So how many people have actually made uh, uh, a vinaigrette dressing at home? Yeah, so basically one part, one part uh, oil, one part vinegar, balsamic vinegar, and you're mixing it, you get a little emulsion. That's exactly what's happening in solvent extraction, except in this process here, you're taking uranium from, a, from your water phase into oil, and then later on, you're taking from the oil back to water phase. And in the process, what you're doing is basically concentrating it up because you use less water. Uh, I got that uh, analogy from a French colleague. So, it's a <laughs> um, so that's solvent extraction. And basically, yeah, example of that is uh, uh, mixer settlers, basically units where uh, they're long elongated uh, rectangular tanks. Uh, that's why I see what I thought I have is white mesa in US. Um, pulse column are basically, it's the same process taking place, but it's on a lesser footprint. Uh, and larger columns. They're called pulse columns. That's actually what's used at Olympic Dam. The alternative actually can be uh, where you actually have the extracting molecule on beads, which actually is on resins, and then you're using resins to do the same types of separation. Uh, and that actually resin is used at, for example, at Heathgate Resources, uh, Beverly operations. The resins themselves are beads, but they can also be used in resin and pulp. Um, because they're slightly coarser, uh, you'll be able to separate the, the, the solid material away from it by screening. So it, it negates the fact of having a solid liquid separation step. You can also run higher pulp uh, process pulps uh, at 58%. Simplistically, you'll be looking at doing a, a, an adsorption circuit where you basically load the, the resin and then the stripping or elution part where you take it off, okay? Slightly higher capex, uh, capital expenditure, but lower operating expenditure. And one of the key things that resins typically have is resins tend to fracture and the fractured particles, you probably have a potential to actually lose some of the uranium. Um, one of the interesting things to actually look at the two separation is basically solvent extraction was developed 
uh, and used in the 50s and 60s more on the Western world. Uh, the, the Russian space were very much uh, on the resin. So resin is actually used uh, a lot in the Soviet and ex-Soviet states. So once you've got a rich solution now, which has got hardly any impurities, you're looking at transforming the uranium from the solution to a solid phase. Now that typically involves just increasing the, the, the pH. A uh, couple of variables apply here as well, like anything. So solution flow, environmental regulations, uh, reagent availability, temperature, and also converter requires basically where that product will go down the fuels in the fuel cycle, okay? Uh, you have the options of reagents looking at ammonia, peroxide, caustic, uh, lime, or milk or magnesia. Now, all of those things, when you end up sort of precipitating uranium out, initially, it'll look yellow, okay? Um, you can use tank precipitation followed by filtration. Uh, and in some cases, you can actually most, most of the times, depending on how much material you're looking at producing, in some cases, it can be running batch processes. So the operation at Cominec in Niger, that produced about 2,000 tons of uranium per year. That, was, that used the batch process. Okay. Um, and, uh, and converters prefer uh, uranium in U04 or U308. Uh, the choice of reagent used, you can use um, uh, ammonia or you can use... Uh, uh, magnesia, for example, but the thing is, if you use milk of magnesia, you're going to be introducing magnesium, okay, that goes into your product. Uh, a lot of converters don't want those sort of impurities coming to their site anymore. So they have a preference to actually just take U04, U308, okay. Um, well, the reason they, they uh, are reluctant now to take it is because they need to have their own evaporation ponds to hold those wastes. So they want to get rid of that at the, at the mine site. Uh, once you've got your precipitated material, you're looking at uh, displacing the water and, and drying your product. So uh, you can do that in a, in a sort of spin flash dryer, for example. And for, in this particular example, I've marked up the hydro peroxide precipitate. So you can look at about 150 to 480 degrees. Um, it'll convert that. In, some, in those cases, it'll also push off the crystalline water as well. Uh, and you can go even further and convert it to a final product, which is calcining. In this case here, uh, that peroxide will go from uh, UO4 to UO2. But I've given an example of uh, ammonia, actually, uh, ammonium uh, diurinate. Uh, that gets calcined at about 650 to 800 degrees. But the benefit of that is basically you'll be able to drive off the ammonia and recover that and send it back to your process. Okay. So once you've got your calcium materials, it basically is packing uh, the end product uh, and delivery to converters. And those are basically chosen by the customers. And at this part of this process, in most of the operation, they have a tendency to actually uh, automate this heavily. So there's minimal radioactive contamination exposure to personnel. Um, and I've, I've actually shown the, just a, a, a CAD diagram of an automated packaging uh, plant. And you can see there on, on the right, uh, drums material coming in and going loaded into shipping containers. So uh, your product, you're looking at actually getting it out to customers. So uh, it's sold, as I mentioned before, on uh, contract and spot markets. Uh, on the right there, you'll be able to see that the uh, ASTM method, that's actually given a reference in terms of what the specs has to be. Um, you're looking at about you know minimum 95% uranium or as 85% U308. There's two scales normally presented there with penalty and without rejection, and uh, and there's a sliding scale in between. And the other thing is uh, limiting uh, two, three, four because it absorbs neutrons, so it's a no-no, uh, which uh, it's generally uh, at about 55% in natural abundance. So that's that's what you're trying to sort of maintain it at, okay? Now, um, tailings management and also waste treatment is, is the last thing that I'll, I'll probably touch on the conventional process. So solid materials in terms of solid tailings, you have to dispose it based on the local uh, laws. Uh, in Niger, because they have very low uh, rainfall, they actually use dry storage. In McLean, they actually use wet storage on a tailings facility. 
And you can see that uh, this is the very sensitive. So this is this is the actual uh, fresh water coming into the plant, and that's your tailings manage management facility, and that's exactly what you're seeing over there. Uh, and the water treatment plant photos is is that that photo there. So again, you're looking at uh, complying with what the local laws are, so you can actually remove all those impurities and have water for release. Um, and Canada has quite stringent controls on that, so uh, Canada is a, a very good example of that. So that was the conventional process. Heap leach. What is heap leach? So if you look at the flow sheet that I've got before, basically you're looking at all that put into a single step, okay? Um, and it's really suitable for low-grade material where the ore is crushed and then agglomerated and put onto heaps. And once it's made into a heap, you're irrigating the solution. So the heap itself requires uh, a liners to put underneath where the irrigated solution will collect. Uh, that solution is then sent to your the process plant and the uranium is recovered and the liquor sent back uh, through. Normally it's a slow process. It can take uh, between three to nine months. It's uh, low, it's moderate on capital, but really, really low on operational expenditure. Uh, the recovery itself, you can use solvent extraction or iron exchange, as I mentioned before. Uh, it has been used in Niger and in Finland, actually, Tal Talvivara is the old name, Sotkomo plant. Sotkomo mine in Finland actually uses uh, a heap leach operation as well for, for base metals recovery, but they are also looking at recovering uranium from that solution. So you can see here that. You're looking at uh, the start of stacking and that's what a, a, a heap looks like, okay? And the alternative is uh, in-situ leach. Now, in-situ leach involves drilling and well preparation and cell irrigation. Well, one of the key things about uh, ISL for it to work is you need to have the right geological settings, okay? Um, and what that does is basically removes all those uh, upfront processes. So you can see there's a lot of blocks that have gone out. Those blocks represent multi-million dollar investments in terms of capital, okay? Um, and um, with, with um, Catherine at uh, Chemical Engineering, I think what's important to realize now here is uh, once we move into this space here, we're not looking at mining engineers, we're starting to look at reservoir engineers and hydrologists, okay? Because for this to work, you need to have all bodies that are sandwiched in clay layers. So that's where the, the uranium solution will stay. Normally you're looking at um, uh, injecting the reagent into that ore body over 18 to 24 months. You're uh, effectively preparation of that. And then once it's ready, you're actually pulling that solution out for uranium recovery. Uh, you have monitoring wells as well on the sides to make sure that you know nothing's really leaking out. Uh, this is a very low capital and uh, uh, operating expenditure operations, uh, less waste generation and minimal surface disturbance. As you can see that that folder at the bottom, which is uh, in uh, Smith Ranch Highlands, you can see that those basically are uh, wellheads, but doesn't look like an open pit, okay? Um, and typically the solutions are very low, so iron exchange is used for, for recovering the uranium. Uh, you've got basically different patterns that you can use as well. So these red ones represent the extraction points and the blue are injection wells. So on the processing side, are there any questions? <laughs> I've got a question online while people think about it. Um, some operations have moved from alkaline to acid leach, hence carbonate minerals seem not to have been a sufficient deterrent to the use of acid or of the, or of the economics changed? Um, it could be, well, the carbonate itself is very expensive reagent to use. So um, I think in that case that the economics uh, is probably more favorable. Um, and the other thing is, but that's probably required a lot of change from the legislation side of things as well. Typically alkaline leaching for ISL was used in the US for the fact that you are not dissolving a lot of impurities. So for example, iron doesn't come in in the alkaline process. Um, so I, I think it's more the economic drive as well. So as it's cheaper. Thank you. And I've got a fact for Dave, that Davidite was named, after, was named by Sir Douglas Mawson after the Australian geologist, Tanit William Edgeworth David. There you go, fact for you. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Neelash, do you have any information on the prospects for in situ leaching in Western New South Wales? Um, do you think it'll be able to compete with Kazakhstan if and when the New South Wales government re removes the ban? Um, full disclosure, I have no idea. I haven't really looked at that. So uh, I know that, yeah, the New South Wales government has now changed its position to allow exploration for it. So I think we're quite a long way away before they'll even look at us exploiting it. So, uh, but hey, Tez is open for it, but they don't have a uranium. Um, should we move on? Yep. Uh, so in the last part of the slides, I guess, uh, some of the innovation work that's taking place now, uh, jet boring, actually. Uh, this is a technique that's been developed by uh, Cameco in Canada, and they use it at Cigar Lake at the underground mining operation. Uh, this involves basically freezing the ore body and the surrounding rocks with chill brine in large pipes, and then creating a tunnel. Uh, you're using uh, jet water to actually extract the ore. There's a pilot hole drilled through the old body and then the water boring nozzle is inserted. So basically you're washing at high pressure or using high pressure water to, to carve out the ore uh, and that pulls it down and you have uh, bins that get filled in. Normally uh, in Canadian operations, all the milling, all the crushing and grinding actually takes underground and then they send it up, up to the top. But one of the things with this approach is actually you still have personnel underground, right? So. Um, not that they're exposed to any risk, but the fact is they're underground. It does, you haven't removed all the risks. In contrast, there's another technique that's been uh, developed uh, by Orano, also in Canada, uh, called Surface Excess Borehole Resource Extraction, SABA. Uh, this is a non-surface based mining technique. So there's nobody that's underground, but it's, um, it's targeted to basically small, deep uh, pockets of ore. Uh, so they claim that it's, you know, uh, easy for easy to flex and it's also scalable depending on what the market is doing as well uh, from the safety point of view there's nobody underneath underground so uh, it's it's positive in that sense and then less foot smaller footprint and lower water and energy demand as well so that's that's a positive for the environment they're looking at actually uh, uh, rolling this out for the midwest project you know, as a potential because they have tested it at uh, at uh, mclean lake uh, over the last five, 10 years, okay. Now I mentioned earlier bef before that uh, sorting, uh, radiometric sorting worked well, yes it does. But the other technique that's actually come across uh, and it's been sort of been considered by two, propon two proponents now is, uh, is abrasion based technique. So Elevate Uranium, which is an Australian mob, uh, they're looking at for their uh, Maranica operations in Namibia. Uh, high pressure slurry abrasion, sorry, high, high pressure slurry ablation technique uh, that's been by DISA technologies. They're both actually looking at uh, taking the uranium containing particle and basically rubbing across each other and removing the, the fines out. Uh, and the uranium typically is actually in the fines, okay? So the benefit of this uh, technique, benefit of the beneficial technique is the fact that you're gonna be reducing the amount of material that's actually being uh, treated. Uh, that's been uh, also needs to be, the less material needs to be disposed of as well. So better outcomes in terms of environments and also on the mining waste as well. Um, Elevate has tested it on Namibian calcrete type deposits. So calcretes are basically a uh, carbonitic material. Uh, Colorado sandstones uh, typically have kindertite ores. They've been, they've, been tested by, by DISA technologies. In terms of uh, other innovation in the processing space, you're looking at nanofiltration. Now, quite sure lots of people are familiar with reverse osmosis, uh, which is used in desalination plants. Uh, it's effectively the same principle, but not at a higher pressure. You're looking at about 40 bar pressure here for this. And what it does is basically allows uh, monovalent and multivalent ion separation. And it's typically being considered and used for reagent recovery. So at Langer Heinrich, which is a carbonate-based uh, operation, carbonate leaching, they're recovering the carbonate to send it back to the process. Uh, and Kalakira in Malawi uses acid and they're recovering acid for that. Um, the other thing is uh, I've got here is saline ion exchange and brackets ENSTO because my colleagues, uh, James Quinn and, and uh, Karen Seldenhoff have been involved in actually this, this work uh, at ENSTO. And the, it's ideal for locations that have got saline or chloride containing waters, right? Uh, there are high capacity strong base ion, 
anion resins uh, that strongly bind to the uranium. Because they bind very strongly, they have a tendency not to release the uranium when you're trying to remove it for, for, for precipitation process. But ENSTO has developed a technique where you can actually transform it and it allows you to uh, take it off the resin. And that technology will be deployed at Honeymoon uh, in South Australia for deployment. So, sorry, I just got a question. Are they still have their, um, they had solvent extraction columns there. Do they still, have, will they still operate the solvent extraction columns with the iron exchange? Uh, at Honeymoon? Honeymoon? No. no. no that, that's, so they're decommissioning they'll, the, the they'll solvent be, extraction. They will be removing the solvent extraction work. Uh, and the last part in terms of innovation is um, fluidized bed precipitation uh, that's been uh, developed by Orano. And they've actually used it at uh, Kazakhstan at the CAT Corporation or joint venture and then Somaya operations in Niger. The idea here is that uh, you're basically growing larger particles, okay? And the larger the particles, the better it separates from, from, from liquor. Uh, and also because it's larger when it's in the drying process and when it goes into the converter as well, there's less dust generation. And for them, they've actually stated that, you know, it has a higher bulk density, so they're actually able to pack more into drums and put more drums into containers. Uh, the Somaya operation has been stated to give them about maybe two to five dollars pound savings previously. So it's, it's quite quite uh, significant for them. Uh, Somaya itself, you have to realize that it's, it's really out nowhere. So everything has to be brought in and then brought out. So if you can reduce your transport costs, it, it does make a significant impact. And the Australian operations. So as, as uh, those are big questions. So we've got uh, Beverly operations uh, in uh, South Australia that's uh, owned by Heathgate Resources. They have an in-situ leach operation uh, and a, a resin process to recover the uranium. And that's that operations sitting there. Uh, four mile is just a couple of k's down the road, okay? Basically, these operations are now all under the one company. And in the past, they used to have uh, uh, this ISL operation used to put the uranium on the resin, and the resin used to be trucked across uh, to that plant for, for further processing and, and, and concentrate production. Uh, the last few years, they actually installed a pipeline. So now the resin just gets piped across. Okay. Olympic Dam, uh, underground mine for copper. Uh, it's got, a, it's got a process that basically uh, you have flotation plant to make a copper concentrate and the, the tails from the flotation plant actually goes downstream to, to remove the uranium. Uh, the operation also produces, apart from copper and uranium, they also produce lead and silver. Um, one of the interesting things about that operation itself is because of the high amounts of uranium, everything is produced on site. It's not a place where the concentrate can be made and shipped across. Australia is very good at doing that, but it doesn't apply for that mine site purely because it's very difficult to, to remove the amount of uranium that's there. Um, and I think uh, the, the, you know, there's a lot of other satellite deposits in South Australia that now could be, you know, could, with BHP sort of buying Oz Minerals, I think it'd probably provide a pathway to have a more centralized approach to treating those uh, contaminated, uranium contaminated copper deposits. Ranger, uh, yep, it's finished producing. Uh, it's undergoing rehabilitation. They used uh, uh, an open cut mine extraction. They had a solvent extraction plan for for the uranium recovery. Uh, as I said, undergoing rehabilitation. So, and the last one is a honeymoon. Uh, now, as Catherine has asked, yeah, they used to have a solvent extraction process. Now they switched switched across. They will be moving to an iron exchange process for the for the project restart. And I think they're talking about starting end of this year, or early next year. In terms of projects, I've only put the the Western Australian part of the map there because that's the that's where all the projects that have been earmarked for potential development. Uh, these were all approved, I think, in the previous. Liberal government and the Labor government has honored that. So you've got uh, Mulga Rock, you've got uh, Waluna, uh, Girili, and Kintyre that are, you know, ready to, to be developed. But those will obviously depend on the market conditions as well. Uh, Cameco is a big operator in that space, but I don't think they have any plans to, to bring those projects online in the near term. Um, 
So just on the last slide, uh, future challenges and opportunities. So obviously process and economics, right? So treating lower grades ores and also to reprocess old tailings is, is an opportunity. Uh, to produce uh, uranium as a byproduct from other operations. So for example, you know, Olympic Dam, they recover the uranium, but there are other uranium deposits where it has metals like cobalt, nickel, vanadium, scandium, uranium. Uh, and I think people are now looking at actually de deriving those values out of that. So uh, it should be a good thing because especially nickel, cobalt, uh, scandium, scandium and rhenium are future facing commodities, you know, you need for, for low energy transition. And also looking at adopting and integrating alternative process technologies like bio leach is one of those. Uh, safety, provide safe work conditions and reduce you know, exposure to, to radioactivity. From an uh, environmental point of view, looking at you know, reducing impact and considering sustainable development. We'll also have to be you know, cognizant of the fact that rules and laws will be changing, so we need to be adaptive to that. And last part, I've, I've left it there as a social license because you know, transparent, transparent engagement with your local population and wider community. Uh, it's going to be key to, to sort of any mining operations, you know, so all under the lens of ESG. And that's me. Thanks, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, at the back. Yeah. <laughs> um, going back to the very start, I'm um, thinking about the reserves of uranium. Uh, supposing the world wants to switch across to uranium from coal, have we got enough uranium to power the world for a long time? I don't yeah. know what the reserves are actually like globally. I, I think you've got there's a significant amount of reserves of uranium. Uh, I think numbers are in the order of 100, 150 years worth, easy. So there's a lot of uranium. Um, uh, and I think uh, governments and, and, and different organizations are now sort of waking up to the fact that uranium was never, or nuclear has, with my experience in France when I was working with a the company there, uranium was never, or nuclear energy was never the end all energy. It was, it was an energy to provide you the time to develop your renewables. Mm -hmm. It's a transition sort of measure, right? But at the moment, the demand for, for energy is, is outstripping. And the fact is a lot of, a lot of supplies actually coming from fossil fuels. Mm. So, but in terms of the amount of uranium that's around there, there's a significant amount of uranium to, to cover for that. Thanks, Catherine. Um, have you been to all of these places? Have you physically seen these? I've been to some of those, yes. Well, um, I reckon that uh, there'd be a lot of interest in that, uh, popularizing that, because so many people in Australia are ignorant of, of uh, you know, the fact that we are an active, you know, uh, you know, resource base and, and that we have several producers. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, the engineers of Australia are looking at defining clean energy, uh, if you like, uh, area of practice within engineering, excluding uh, nuclear. Yeah. So they're, and, and simply because they're just not aware of it being useful. Yeah. And if more people were sort of saying, well, hang on, this is a really important field. It is a clean energy. And it's something that, of course, Australian engineers who want to work globally, which we, we all do from time to time, right. um, that's, that's essential. Otherwise, we will uh, lose our accreditation. No, I agree. I agree. We need to be active in that in that space, and I think more so now with with the AUKUS agreement and you know needing to develop this, the the skill set to to help that. So with yeah. moving to the supporting nuclear space will be important. Well, and if I can suggest, uh, Jane McMaster, the current chief engineer at Engineers Australia, is considering this very topic now. And so the more folks who can contribute to that discussion and 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 uh, give her some guidance and information on that would be remarkably, uh, I think, uh, helpful, I think. Okay, good advice. Yeah, I think we'll try and reach out to her. Thank you. Nilesh, I just wanted to um, reinforce your answer to the earlier question. We're not going to run out of uranium. Like there's just such vast quantities of this material. And then we are, we're only using about 5% of the energy in the fuel rods in the reactors. Um, so we can reprocess and tap huge amounts of energy and then there's like essentially unlimited uranium in seawater it's expensive but you know and people people are saying that it 
it's regenerated from inside the earth. Um, so I think if we, we we're just not going to run out of uranium, it's not a problem. But um, I just want you, you gave so many international examples as as Dave just touched on. Is it is it the case that Ansto is like a leading provider of knowledge and capability and expertise in this field that you've just described and that you've got international clients tapping into that expertise? Yes, um, we have international clients that are reaching out to the to us in those. Uh, uh, some the photos themselves are uh, they've sort of come across from my past experience, uh, but and still uh, minerals has worked with those clients. So yes, and they do reach out to us for for those uh, specialized uh, input. Great. Let's just go to the last question. Mindful of time. Thank you, and thank you for a great presentation. Um, I'm going to ask a slightly more nuanced question, which isn't the reserves of uranium, but if you wanted to scale up uranium production because you had a larger nuclear industry, how easy is it actually to do that at market rates? Because you talked earlier about the fact that there were certain break-even yeah. points where it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so if you wanted to double production, you know, what sort of numbers would you be looking at? Um, yeah, so it's a question, question about what the incentivized price will be. Um, but you're looking at a sustainable price of definitely above $80. Today it was about 55. Spot price is about 55. The so at present price, you're not going to be able to. No, and the other thing is, so uh, one of my charts actually talked about the fact that tradition historically it's about 60,000 tons per year of uranium production. At the moment, we're about 45,000 tons because uh, Kazakh, which is a large producer, has throttled back. Canadian producers have stopped some of their mines. Uh, so those two supplies will have to come on board first in order to actually bring you back to the 60,000 ton market, right? Uh, once, once those supplies come on board, then you'll be able to looking at uh, other projects and you need definitely a higher price than that and over a long term. Yeah, so. just, just remember that... Uh... Just remember that even if the price went from 50 bucks to 80 bucks, it's still a, it's still a very small part of the value chain of the whole cost of power generation. Yeah. Fantastic. And on that note, we'll call this um, seminar to a close. And thank you once again for all of your participation and to our speaker for a very interesting presentation. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you.